Hello and welcome back and today I want to talk about a familiar subject. I want to talk about Gen 4 SSDs and even more familiar, I want to talk about this. This is the Samsung 990 Pro and this is not the first time I've talked about this SSD here on the channel. Indeed, in the past, I've spoken about Samsung's 980 Pro. When the Gen 4 or the fourth generation of NVMe SSDs arrived on the scene, brands like Samsung and indeed WD, let's give them their credit, were some of the first to crack the 7,000 megs per second barrier in terms of performance. More often, you know, kind of focused on read more than write. That came a little bit later. But back in late 2020, they were the first to cross that line. They weren't the first to release Gen 4 SSDs, but they were certainly the first to crack 7,000 thousand megs now because they were first at the party they got all of the acclaim but over time you know contenders arrived not just their big big rivals at the likes of seagate but on top of that some of the middling brands that were all jumping aboard the fires on or the inner grit bandwagon in order to produce their own gen 4 ssds and those gen 4 ssds were all cracking 7,000 megs and in many cases exceeding that sequential performance of the original Samsung 980. Not only in read, but also write. Fast forward to late 2022 and Samsung kind of, I don't know, woke up. Let's be mean about it if you want. For some reason, it felt like they were sitting on their laurels and concentrating more on the enterprise and high-end flash sector. And they suddenly turned their attentions back to the Gen 4 and they released the 990 Pro series. This is an SSD now available in 4 terabytes that's right gen 4 ssds and they'll be more universally available and in a certain frame of mind affordable and this ssd that is promoting high-end over 7k performance in sequential read and improved sequential write compared with the 980 that came before it is a decent enough ssd in terms of performance but there's more to an ssd than that and in today's review we're going to talk about this ssd its design and its makeup because there's still a lot of proprietary about samsung when it comes to their components we're of course going to talk about the firmware stuff from earlier this year that we covered here on the channel and of course we're going to run it through the benchmarks there on the test machine but without further ado let's crack this open again the retail packaging nice and shiny occasionally i probably should allude to the 980 that came before it not a vast amount's changed about the packaging there you go through this again the 990 pro was revealed and released last year but the fourth uh, earlier this year but it was the 4tb that took a lot more time to make now inside you got a little plastic chassis frame there and inside you have got the ssd that lovely small exceedingly thin gen 4 m2 mvme also inside there inside the casing we should have an in uh, details on our warranty with the drive arriving with five years of manufacturer's warranty and recommendations that you go ahead and install samsung's magician desktop software to update the firmware now why have i brought up firmware twice well let's get the elephant in the room out of the way um earlier in 2022 uh, I say 2023 even, they hit something of a faux pas when it turned out one of their firmwares on this series of drives was having difficulties and it was, a, a, you know, degrading the health rating on a number of Samsung 980 and 990 Pro SSDs and the uh, early uh, capacities that were released of the 990 Pro were affected. Now that has been resolved, there has been a new firmware update as we covered in the videos earlier this year and these drives are definitely going to arrive with the newer firmware but still nonetheless I think we have to at least acknowledge that there are some users that looked at Samsung's handling of that firmware issue and SSD people that had bought that SSD and suddenly gone I'm overly keen on the way this was handled my SSD suddenly just telling me according to smart that it's dying there and I can't reverse it there are going to be uses that may not come back but I will say that this is arriving out the gate with that new firmware and and has resolved that health issue there but another thing I want to talk about a little bit in the hardware makeup of this we'll get to in just a moment but as you can see this SSD looks you know pretty much like the ones that came before it hopefully on screen there's already been some close-ups of it there but as you may have already noticed on the close-ups the back's empty. This is a 4TB SSD. Knock it around for 271 NICA. Uh, that is the RRP without the heatsink. If you want the heatsink, it's 279 NICA. But really intriguing that this is bare there on the back. Now, why is that intriguing? Well, SSDs, when you reach a certain capacity, you end up leveraging 
price versus performance by the number of those large black cells we can see there on the back there they're known as the NAND, the NAND flash, or the memory. Not memory like a computer, although it does have that there in DRAM. These are where your data lives. And generally, once you go to 2TB or above, manufacturers will put more NAND cells on the front and back of the SSD to distribute the storage. So, for example, 4TB might be 4, 1, uh, uh, TB uh, cells each for it to read and write to and therefore that kind of improves the performance when it's accessing more NAND cells but by doing so you increase the price of the SSD because you're creating more NAND cells which ups the production cost which ultimately affects the price. Now some of the smaller SSD uh, capacities again we'll look at 500 gig or 1 TB will arrive with one or two cells and they don't need to cover the back because they can reach that lovely nuanced balancing act between performance and capacity and have it on those cells. What's really strange, for me at least, about this one is this SSD, and again we've got those two NAND cells there, those are 176 layer 3D TLC NAND or VNAND from them. Now it is very you know good quality NAND there. The durability hasn't changed vastly over its predecessor uh, with the 4TB a terabytes written of 2,400 uh, uh, terabytes written, which is 0 0.3 drive writes per day. But it's the fact they've only put it in two cells. They didn't do what a lot of 4TB drives do and put a couple there and a couple more on the back and separating the DRAM as well. Because on the top there, we can see that cell of DRAM. And that's a four gig cell, I believe that cell they've gone for one single cell with a complete blankness on the back now in terms of heat um, distribution and uh, attaching itself to a heat sink that may be very beneficial because those cells are all going to be completely attached to the third or first party heat sink immediately to dissipate that heat as it's being generated gen 4 but still nonetheless i'm kind of surprised they didn't go for the double-sided route one for NAND distribution but two also for cost um, when it comes to the performance of this, uh, the read and write speeds of sequential, so that's synthetic, are 7,450 megabytes per second sequential read, which puts it among the fastest, if not the fastest overall, Gen 4 SSD in the market right now. Again, when you look at the larger capacities of drive, because they distribute more NAND cells, that's why you find capacities in a product family get faster as they add more capacity there's more cells being written into not unlike raid in a nas system but on top of that there is the IELTS 4k random IELTS that is the, how many per second individual um bits it can access on the drive the otherwise known as the io and that's something that samsung even in its previous generation of the 980 pro there always excelled at when you look currently at the newest generation of gen 5 ssds we've talked about a couple of them here on the channel already for example the a data 970 or the legend 970 something we reviewed on the channel a few days ago the ssd although it's sequential read write performance is certainly higher at 10 gig or a thousand i'm sorry uh, 10,000 megs up 10,000 megs down its IOPS rating is actually lower than this. Samsung's SSDs, even since the 2021st initial release of the 980, were always very high, with this drive arriving at the 4TB model of 1.4 million um, 4K read IOPS, random, and in terms of write, 1.5 million, so exceedingly high while still maintaining the Gen 4 generation. So. Again, that distribution of that NAND really surprised me, and a big part of that improved performance, and it's still able to hit those numbers, despite the lower quantity of NAND around there, is to do with that controller, the Samsung Pascal. Now, that controller is proprietary. We don't know as much or can dig into it as much as we can with the likes of the fires on E26 or kind of in a in no grip controller that we talked about here in on the channel before, the IG5556, for example. But... Still, nonetheless, they're clearly eking as much out of that a controller as possible. I'm curious in our testing what we can hit in terms of temperature, because again, a lot of eggs in a couple of baskets there. But still, nonetheless, I quite like what I'm seeing here. Now, before we go onto the benchmarks, I do think it right that we at least talk about the price point. Again, arriving at 271 nicker in the UK and 279 nicker in the UK if you want the proprietary heatsink there. How does that compare against its two 
big competitors are arguably the WD Black SN850X and the Samsung, I'm sorry, the Seagate 5 CUDA 530. Both of these aren't quite those, they're modified versions and that's the original. But if you look at the 550X, that's WD's reapproach to Gen 4 when they, much like Samsung, were the first to enter the fray in 2020 with their 7K drive. Their, their drive arrives at the same capacity of 4TB at 268 pounds so just a handful of quid cheaper the seagate drive there the fire cuda 530 again neither of them with the heatsink there arrives at 279 so a fraction more than the standard drive but certainly between the two of them we're seeing relative pricing arrive whether we're still vaguely at the same price point between them with a little bit of give in between now the seagate has got that higher durability rating attached to it there. And the WD has been around quite a long time, much like the Seagate as well, therefore being more flexible with its pricing. Overall, I would say the Samsung Drive, given its relative lateness <coughs> in the Gen 4 arena, given that they were there at the start, but it's taken them this long to release the uh, 4TB model towards not the end of Gen 4, but certainly not in its peak, I'm surprised it's not a little cheaper than it is. I do suspect this will be available on offers and sales more regularly. Certainly, I think that RRP is exactly as it states. That's the recommended retail price. This is certainly going to be available for much less than that. But still, the initial arrival price point of this drive does seem just a little higher than I would like to see right now, given the relative age of Gen 4 and other Gen 4 players in the market right now. But that's enough talking about the drive and its makeup itself. Let's get this drive in the test machine and put it through its paces. Okay, so we've added this drive into our system and we're gonna run a few different kinds of unusual tests. And the first thing we're gonna test, of course, is temperature, and this time without the heatsink. Because remember, we're buying this without a heatsink, which means you might be using a third party, or some of you won't wanna play fast and loose and not use one at all. I disagree with you fundamentally, but on here we can see the Samsung 990 Pro. Here, the 4TB listed on Samsung Magician. We've assigned the drive to the letter S, but I will say, because we're only bench testing the temperature right now uh, we've got the drive on uh, I um, as you can see here on crystal disk but it's only showing as gen 3 times 4 we're just using a gen 3 times 4 slot for this bit don't worry later on in the video we are going to be going straight into a gen 4 times 4 don't worry this is just to utilize it here for the sake of being able to use a heat sink in just a moment but what we're going to do nice and simple is just start raising the temperature on that SSD just a wee bit there but, but just bear in mind we are still talking about drive on a gen 3 times 4 slot so if I go ahead select our drive and just start running those tests now ignore the numbers the numbers do not matter what we want to see is going through just how quickly this drive is going to raise its temp because what we're doing right now although it's arguable as you can see we started at 38 degrees then we went up to 46 degrees pretty darn quickly given that we've not really done any tests at all so we've refreshed there that went up to 54 degrees exceedingly fast now yes we were running a consistent one gig oversaturation there on the drive. And remember, these numbers do not represent real numbers there. What we're looking at here are those temps. The idea that we've gone in and done relatively low level stuff to this drive and it's already gone up quite substantially. So now we're gonna reboot the system and this time attach ourselves a heat sink. Right, so we've rebooted the system, so let's go ahead now and restart those tests, because this time we got ourselves a lovely heat sink on there. Again, if we go to that graph, we're going to be able to see those spikes that we saw earlier on, as they got recognised with a check every one second. So this time, we're going to go in while we've got OBS recording, again, going into uh, the same app, so we're going to go into AJA, 1 gig, same drive, there we go, it's on there, and we're going to see how this time it deals with it. Now it's got a heat sink pre-attached to the drive. Will it in any way assist us in maintaining that core temperature? Again, remember, this isn't about the performance numbers there. This is about that rising temperature. And arguably, as you've already seen here on the previous test, and by the time we got to like the 15 second mark, this SSD was already high in the 50s. And as we can see, it is holding out for much, much longer that heatsink is definitely 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 going to be needed it's still running those tests there but as we can see as it goes through 
We've still not even got to the halfway point on 45. It's just crossed that line. And that gives you some idea about the necessity of these heat sinks. So when you do see an SSD like this, even in Gen 4, and I don't even want to get started on Gen 5, Gen 4, you're still going to need a heat sink with sustained activity. And as you can see, it's just doing better overall. But now, let's stop that test there. Dead set. Let's get this SSD into a Gen 4 slot and start our benchmarks. Right, so let's get down to the benchmarks here. On the background, we've got the reported speeds and stuff from Samsung's own website. Let's minimize that there. As you can see, they're kind of touting there that it can hit these quite interesting numbers here overall. And again, they're only listing 2 TB at the time of recording, but 4 TB should be added later this week. Um, we've got the drive on end. As you can see, this time we are back on a 4 times 4 lane. So we've got everything there that we want to play with. And the way the tests today are going to be working out, we're going to be using a crystal disk mark. I apologize if screen goes black uh, while I'm doing that that's as you do with uh, Windows admin privilege we're also going to be using Atto disk benchmark there we're going to be running on top of that ASSSD and finally we're going to be using once again we've already used it earlier on AJA we're going to be running all of those different benchmark tools on this SSD which do give you different ranges services and kind of quantifications of the performance of this drive however I'm not going to be able to do it while talking here on screen as you can see even if I do select that S drive there and select one gig start benchmarking there what you'll find is while i'm using screen recording software like this obs it will impact the performance which can be a problem and therefore start showing us false results so what i want to do is not try to show those results while i've got obs running i'm going to cancel obs close everything down i could have used an external capture card but it's being used on other projects and come back in about an hour when all of the tests have been conducted three tests per app let's fast forward about 45 to 50 minutes for you guys and get to the results and we're back as you can see here we have finished our test now i'll be straight with you the temperatures luckily we have that heat sink on right because even with the heat sink we still hit a temperature of 63 degrees now 63 degrees isn't that bad realistically the ssds are not going to throttle anywhere near this temperature here but nevertheless if i didn't have the heat sink on here i'm pretty sure this ssd would have definitely throttled around this point this was during some of our deeper atto tests but let's actually get to the results you know so straight up we'll go for the most straightforward easy and arguably synthetic tests of all these are the ones with crystal disk now going through uh, the one gig test file the four gig test file and the 16 gig test file we can see that we did exceed that 7000 number there but what was really interesting is we hit that 6700 sequential right on every single instance the only issue i found on this test machine which i should have added earlier on is an intel let's get my system properties up there an intel i5 12th gen CPU there. The one issue we found with this was that we started seeing a bottleneck there on the right. That's very much to do with my own SSD that I'm utilizing inside this system. Unfortunately, the OS is running on a SATA based SSD, which unfortunately creates a bottleneck. So we're going to focus a lot more on that 4K random read IOPS. And I've got to say, 1.5 million, 1.5 million, and just shy of 1.5 million there. I'm really, really happy with those numbers, even with the mixed performance there, doing a very, very good job. But clearly, oversaturation was key as we went to the larger capacities, but initially, Initial performance was obviously higher with a larger blockier data to get its teeth into on the 4 and 16 gig overall. Next up we'll make our way over to the Atto Disk Benchmark results. It's worth highlighting with the Atto Disk Benchmark results. We are of course talking about a different mathematical calculation of what gigabytes and megabytes are translated into because this is issuing it in gigabytes. Ergo the numbers always appear slightly lower but that's because of the quantifying factor of gigabytes versus megabytes. And as you can see there we saw consistently high numbers there on the read and right and pretty much what i would like to have seen again this is utilizing a quarter of a gig one gig and four gig test files and if we switch over to the reported iops there again these aren't the smaller level iops we still saw very high numbers given the file sizes that we were dealing with here and overall again solid numbers not as high as i would have liked to have seen and i am still utilizing this on a cpu that's you know, it's not Gen 13, but it's a pretty darn Gen uh, 12 uh, CPU there with 16 gig of memory. I would like to have seen just a fraction higher there. So if we come out of that, we go into our next test. That's ASSSD and move into that one there. 
Again, this is where we saw some quite peculiar results overall. Again, we saw them reasonable enough. And if we make a direct comparison here, we go into the photo section here. We find ourselves uh, the Samsung SSD that we reviewed a wee while ago. This is a 980 Pro 1TB. And we compare how these numbers sit with the 1TB uh, 980 Pro, we can see a one gig there was hitting in terms of we'll get away from IOPS that 5000 there. So it was kind of strange this SSD, even in spite of its high capacity and class level, was hitting a lower number. <clears throat> now, part of that could have been the NAND distribution, part of that could have been oversaturation during these tests, but I was kind of underwhelmed by those performance numbers we saw overall. Even now, if we go ahead and reissue that testing and we go ahead while we're still using OBS to record here in the background and we go ahead and redo those tests with the Samsung 40B 1 gig and just run it here while I'm talking the numbers themselves they're higher but not hugely high and they're still going to work at an average over time so it's still not absolutely mind like bashing but the numbers haven't changed an awful lot overall I'm just a little underwhelmed by the AS SSD results, but that could have been to a number of factors beyond my control, be they oversaturation or the test machine. Prior to this, the Crystal Disk and the Atto benchmark results weren't too shabby, in my opinion. So last up, we can look at moving along onto uh, the AJA performance benchmarks. Now, these are utilizing uh, a 5K red media file there, so a big hefty file. And what we're really looking at on these, we're not looking too much at the sustained performance numbers because unlike the very small uh, and less dense files that we've been testing up to this point, these are way, way more dense. And what we really want to look at are these little graphs here at the bottom. Let's make sure my face isn't blocking that too much. I might go ahead and turn my camera off there. And what we want to see is as few dips as possible. And I'm pleased to say across the one, four, and six, um, sorry, and f one, four, and 16 gig tests, we didn't see a lot of dips. We saw nice sustained performance over these consistent multimedia files, which is a very good sign for that bl bigger, blockier, more sequential data in these tests. The numbers aren't that high, but again, this is not a test where we really value the average sequential and artificial megabytes per second there. Overall, you know, this is a good Gen 4 SSD. There was never going to be any doubt in my mind that the Samsung 990 uh, Pro was going to be a bad SSD. And when we look at the performance, and again, looking at that temperature, these are all fairly good numbers we're seeing here. The one thing I would say, though, is this SSD does feel like it's arrived a little later than it should have. The 4TB version of this, when the 990 Pro was first rolled out, with the 1TB and 2TB respectively, you know, the, the, the complaints then aren't hugely different to my own now. It's an SSD that does give good performance, exceptionally high 4K random IOPS, but the price point, at least rolling out the gate, is a little more pricey. If we go to Amazon.com here and just head straight in and actually spell Amazon.com correctly and put in the Samsung 990 Pro 2TB, Sorry about the keyboard being close to the mic there. And we look at that, you know, it's already started seeing quite substantial price dips there. So... Those price dips, you know, they're pretty darn good. Bear in mind how artificial that price dip probably is. And even if you worked out the price per terabyte and, you know, doubled that into 270, that's not that different to the prices we quoted at the beginning of this video. Overall, the Samsung 990 Pro, you know, is a good, solid performing SSD. It's just a little bit overpriced and a little, price it a little bit more than it should be. And the NAND distribution, I do genuinely still believe, does give something of a an issue with regards to sustained performance you know in larger file types only having those two nand you know it, you know would benefit the price point i would said on a lot of other ssds something we're not really seeing here overall it is a good ssd that's arguably just a little bit more expensive than it should be right now particularly in the gen 5 generation when most other gen 4 ssds are seeing quite substantial price cuts by comparison but this has been my review of the Samsung 990 Pro 4TB. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Do let me know in the comments if you have. Um, we will be doing some performance and comparison between this and the likes of the SN850X very, very soon, just like we did in the previous generation on the 850 versus the 980 Pro. If you've got any other tests you want to see, do let me know. But apart from that, have yourselves a fantastic week, and I will see you next time.